the Pentecostal rest. Pentecost, the 50th day, was the Jubilee day, as the 50th year was the Jubilee year. The 50th day followed a Sabbath day cycle, as the Jubilee year followed a Sabbath year cycle. As the antitype of the Jubilee year will usher the world into the glorious rest in Messiah's kingdom and in the new covenant relationship with God, so the antitype of the Jubilee day ushered believers into a rest of faith at Pentecost. So St. Paul explains, we who believe do enter into rest. All truly Christ are enabled to keep a Sabbath rest of faith and trust all the time, not merely on the seventh day or on the first day. Every day to them is a rest by faith in Christ's sacrifice, a Sabbath to the soul for shadow of heavenly rest. None could enter into this true Sabbath rest until Jesus had opened the way. His death was necessary as man's ransom price. His resurrection was necessary to enable him to apply that price on our behalf. He ascended on high, there to appear in the presence of God as the advocate for his disciples. He imputes his merits to cover their imperfections and to make their sacrifice acceptable to God that they may suffer with him and be glorified with him. For the faithful there remaineth a rest still more complete to be attained in their resurrection change. Under Jesus' direction, the apostles, his followers, were not to begin their work until they received the Pentecostal blessing, the Holy Spirit, the evidence of their acceptance as sons of God. The only thing they did during that time before their own acceptance was the choosing of a successor for Judas' place. But evidently God never recognized their choice. In his own due time, God brought forth St. Paul to be the twelfth apostle, one of the twelve foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. The error of supposing apostolic succession in the church's bishops was a costly one. It led to many grievous errors. The remainder of part third is deeply interesting. The teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Truly, never man spake like this man. He yet speaks to us all. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yea, and the hour is coming when all shall be privileged to hear his blessed message. All the blind eyes shall be opened, and all the mentally deaf ears shall be unstopped. Wear your peace in. Show it to your friends. Tell them what it means. Invite them to see this drama. All are welcome. Ask why we do not lift collections. We reply, the gospel is free. Nowhere in the Bible are we authorized to solicit money in God's name. Freely we have received, freely we give to others. All of us who witness the preceding parts of this drama are hungry for part four. Now we are to trace the experiences of the church from Pentecost to the present time. We are anxious to look beyond the veil into the future to obtain a glimpse of the church in the heavenly glory as Christ's bride. More than this, we would anticipate the blessings of Messiah's reign in the human uplift from sorrow, sin, crying and dying to perfection and joy in the Creator's image. But the four stepping forward, let us cast the eye of understanding backwards and mark carefully the lessons of the three parts already presented. First, the mighty power of the Creator and His wisdom as manifested in the material universe. Man, the crowning feature, made in His Creator's moral likeness. Second, remembering the deflection of Lucifer to Satan, the beguilement of Eve, 
the disobedience of Adam and the consequent reign of sin and death should impress the lesson of obedience to God. First, God promised by and by to restrain sin and death, and through the glorified Savior as the King of glory to deliver all the willing and obedient from their weaknesses should inspire us with hope and with love for God. Fourth, let us remember the words of Jesus. It was necessary that the Son of Man should suffer and enter into his glory. Let us remember that all who walk in his steps must suffer with him if they would also reign with him. Let us remember that Christ's body or church will be completed by the glorious change of the first resurrection before the establishment of Messiah's kingdom to bless the world. Pentecostal preaching. Only the twelve were specially ordained to apostleship, to be mouthpieces of Jesus to the church. Their decision would bind on earth the things found in heaven and loose on earth things loosed in God's sight. Even these did not receive the Heavenly Father's sanction until Pentecost, when they received the Holy Spirit. Scripturally, no one is authorized to preach or teach except he has received the Spirit of God. And everyone who has received that Spirit has divine authority to preach, wholly irrespective of earthly ordination. This, we are told, is the import of the prophetic words respecting Jesus the head and the church his body. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he hath ordained me to preach good tidings to the meek. All who have received that divine anointing have the divine commission to preach the good tidings. Whoever has not received that heavenly authority cannot be a divine ambassador. In fulfillment of Jesus' words, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom, St. Peter symbolically used two keys in connection with the gospel. The first key on the day of Pentecost to open the door of invitation to all Jews to become members of the body of Christ, the Church, through begetting of the Holy Spirit. Three and a half years later, he used the other key and threw open the door to the Gentiles. Cornelius was the first Gentile admitted to membership in Christ. Thousands of the holiest Jews, by obedience to God's command, came yearly to Jerusalem to observe Pentecost. Thousands thus were attracted to the Pentecostal preaching and carried their blessing and enlightenment throughout the world. There will yet be a second Pentecostal blessing. Only the special servants and handmaids of the Lord share the first and attain the kingdom. Under Messiah's kingdom, God's Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. They will see that of which their ancients prophesied. God's chosen vessel. Of St. Paul, Jesus said, He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name to the Gentiles. He is first brought to our attention as one of those who consented to the death of St. Stephen. Subsequently, he went about breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. When we see the power of the truth in its transforming influence upon the human mind, we are amazed. Yet we should remember that God never coerces the free will. In St. Paul's conversion, Jesus merely showed an honest man wherein he was wrong and what privileges he would have in connection with a divinely directed cause. St. Paul became the successor of Judas. There were to be twelve apostles of the Lamb, a crown of twelve stars on the church's brow, and twelve foundations to the new Jerusalem. And in them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. We are sure St. Paul's name is amongst them. This is in accord with the testimony 
that he was not one whit behind the very chiefest of the apostles and was more abundant in visions and revelations than they all. Matthias was chosen before Pentecost and was never recognized by God. St. Paul is the most prominent amongst the apostles, all of whom were glorious characters, especially chosen of God for his special service. Like the other apostles, St. Paul had nothing to say respecting an eternity of torture for anybody. He declared that those ultimately found unworthy should be punished with everlasting destruction. It is St. Paul who especially set forth that Jesus must come a second time and then must reign until he shall have put all enemies under his feet. Through this noble mouthpiece, Jesus sent us particulars of the resurrection of the just and the unjust, the change of the church at Christ's second coming, the character of Antichrist, etc. If St. Paul's epistles were omitted, how great would be our ignorance on many subjects. Gentiles, fellow heirs, God's covenant with Abraham gave assurance that all the blessings God purposed for mankind would come to them through his posterity. The Jews were the natural seed of Abraham, and properly to them belonged the promises. But when all Jews possessed of the faith of Abraham had been privileged to come in with Jesus and become his joint heirs in the Messianic kingdom, then God, through St. Peter, used the second key to the kingdom. He threw open the door of opportunity to the Gentiles, that they might become fellow heirs with the Jews in the Messianic kingdom. Three and a half years after Pentecost, the angel of the Lord appeared to Cornelius. He told him that now God was ready to accept his prayers and his devotion. He told him to send for St. Peter at Jaffa. From him he would hear words necessary to be believed in order that he might be fully accepted of God and receive the Holy Spirit. Three messengers were sent to fetch St. Peter. Meantime, God prepared the apostle. He was told that what God had cleansed, he should not consider any longer unclean. St. Peter associated his dream with his visitors and promptly went to Cornelius' home. He found Cornelius and his family devout and ready to hear. He proceeded to tell them the true story of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, the call of the church to be his bride class, proving their worthiness by loyalty and faithfulness even unto death. While St. Peter was speaking, these consecrated people drinking in the message fully accepted the terms of discipleship. Then God gave a manifestation of his acceptance of them by the gift of the Spirit, such as was common to all Christians at the beginning of this age. St. Peter astonished then says, if these have received the Holy Spirit, who can forbid them water baptism, which is only a symbol of their consecration to be dead with Christ? Here Gentiles first began to be grafted into the olive tree of Romans 11.17. The Church at Antioch. Gradually the gospel message found hearing ears amongst the Gentiles, but fewer in number. The law training of the Jews had been God's special blessing to them, preparing some of them for the gospel. The first church in which Gentiles seemed to predominate in numbers was at Antioch. Barnabas, Silas, and others were prominent amongst the brethren there, and later St. Paul. It was at Antioch that the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. Many Christians wished that no other name had ever been accepted. The Antioch Church, according to the Bible records, had very simple arrangements, similar to those practiced by Jesus and the Apostles. Forms and ceremonies had not yet entered to crowd out the simplicity of Christ with mere forms of godliness. They met for growth in grace, knowledge, love, and to assist each other in the narrow way. When fairly underway in their study, they partook of the missionary spirit, and authorized and financed a mission which was conducted by St. Paul and Barnabas. Other missions were also conducted, as recorded in the book of Acts. 
Not long after this, the terrible persecutions of Nero and Diocletian came upon the church. These Roman emperors found diversion and relief from ennui in the horrible tortures they inflicted upon the inoffensive followers of Jesus, whose mission in the world is merely to do good to all men, as they have opportunity, especially to the household of faith, and to prepare themselves and each other for association with their Redeemer in the coming kingdom. Why did God permit persecution? The answer is that testings of faith and loyalty to God are as necessary to Jesus' followers as they were to himself, and for the same reason, to develop and crystallize character. These correspond to Jesus' own persecution and crucifixion. Thus he explained, saying, It was necessary that the Son of Man should suffer and enter into his glory. The elect walk in his steps.